Okay, now how does, how does radiation cause cancer? Most people don't know. And why do we use radiation to treat cancer? That seems strange. Well, the body is made of trillions of cells, and in every cell is a nucleus with 46 chromosomes, and there's a pair of regulatory genes in every cell that controls the rate of cell division. So if, you, if one of them is hit by an alpha particle in a random way, I've got both of them, or X-ray, or gamma ray, or beta, the DNA molecule changes biochemically, the cell remains viable and lives on. And then one day, five to 60 years later, and that's the incubation time for cancer. For swine flu, it's two days. For a cold, it's two days. For measles, it's three weeks. But for cancer, it's a long time. And that's the secret of the nuclear industry, that they can, they can not identify the people who develop cancer from the industry, except that if you take and expose people, a population living around the reactor, which Germany did and looked at 16 reactors, and children under five living within 5K of the reactors, the incidence of childhood leukemia was more than double, and the incidence of childhood cancer was high. So you have to take a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of science, and follow people for a long time. Children are very sensitive to radiation, 10 to 20 times more than adults, so they get cancer very readily and very quickly. Fetuses are about a thousand times more sensitive. Yet the nuclear industry uses the standard man, who is a 70 kilogram, white, healthy male, in his 20s, to assess the standard of radiation and the dose people can receive. We actually need to go to the standard embryo, because this can cause embryos to develop later leukemia or cancer or genetic abnormalities. So one day, instead of the cell dividing in a regulated way by mitosis, it produces millions and trillions of cells, and that is a cancer. So it takes a single mutant alpha particle in a, to hit a single gene in a single cell to kill you. But mostly the nuclear industry don't understand this, um, and it's only doctors who really do, and we are not taught about the medical effects of the nuclear industry during a medical course. So when the cancer starts growing, these cells are very aggressive. They invade little blood vessels and lymph vessels, and one cell, one single cell going up to the brain grows into a secondary cancer, right? Or into the liver, and it, it really cancer is a parasite. So the patient withers away as the cancer proliferates, and then the patient dies. It's a hideous disease. It's extremely painful and debilitating and degrading. People become incontinent often of urine and feces. They waste away, and it's the most ghastly disease. The incidence of cancer is rising throughout the world, and as we increase background radiation, so we're going to increase cancer. Plus, we live in a chemical cocktail of 80,000 chemicals used every day, many of which are carcinogenic, most of which have never been tested to see if they actually are carcinogenic. So those chemicals can be synergistic with radioactive elements to produce more cancer than just one chemical or one radioactive element. Do you understand? So we, we are developing a very dangerous environment for the future and our children. Now there are other cells in the body that are even more important than the body cells, the somatic cells, and these are the germ cells, which are the egg and the sperm. And they each control, contain only half the number of genes. When they unite, we have the diploid number normal. Every gene in the sperm and egg is important. We are who we are because of our genes. And if genes get mutated by radiation, that child or future generations can develop disease. How do we know? There was a man called Muller who took Drosophila fruit fly and irradiated them and they developed a gene for crooked wing, which passed, was passed on generation to generation. So we know that genetic abnormalities get passed on. There are over 23,000 genetic diseases now described in the pediatric literature. One of them is my specialty cystic fibrosis. One in 25 white people carry that gene. But you don't know you carry it unless you mate with someone with the same gene because the gene is recessive. So you can have been quite normal because you have a normal gene and gene with cystic fibrosis and not know you're a carrier. But once you mate with another carrier, 
you have a one in four chance of a child developing cystic fibrosis, diabetes, dwarfism, phenylketonuria, mental retardation. There are inborn errors in metabolism. There are so many. So as we increase the background radiation and as plutonium gets into testicles and sees it into ovaries and the genes are mutated, we will over time, generations, see an increased incidence of genetic abnormalities. In fact, by inducing radiation in the environment, we will be producing random compulsory genetic engineering for the rest of the time. Don't forget we're not the only species on Earth, nor are we the most important. There are 30 million species that cohabit the planet with us, and they all have genes, and they all have chromosomes, and they all can develop cancer or abnormalities. After Three Mile Island, there were some plants that had two deformed heads. Cows were being born with two heads. So animals and plants develop mutations as well. So that's why it's, these are the most important cells in the body because they affect future generations. Okay, now when, when the uranium is mined, of course huge amounts of fossil fuel are used to mine the uranium. So therefore you have to mine millions of tons of uranium to get enough to fuel one reactor for one year. And how's it mined? You go to our mines in Australia, huge trucks, huge belching uh, uh, exhaust fossil fuel. So if you look at the whole of the nuclear fuel cycle, from mining to milling to enrichment, our uranium in Australia is enriched in Paducah, Kentucky. They turn it into uranium hexafluoride, a gas, force it through micropore filters made of nickel. On one side, say 238, because it's larger, and the other side, 235. And they have a cascade of these filters, thousands of them. The nickel becomes radioactive, but it's very valuable nickel, so that they are selling it on the open market, and it's being used actually to make children's teeth braces, artificial hip replacements, uh, furniture, knives and forks, and jewelry. Uh, we only know because some scrap metal dealers have guided counters and find the radioactive. This is a very energy consuming process, forcing the gas through these side. At Paducah, Kentucky, they have two 1,500 megawatt coal fire plants to enrich the uranium. But don't you know, nuclear power produces no CO2. It doesn't at the nuclear power plant, but it does all the way through from uranium mining, milling and enrichment, building the reactor, making cement is an extremely energetic CO2 producing process. Then after 40 years, you have to close the reactor, let it cool down radiologically, and then take it apart by remote control using robots because it's so radioactive and that requires more money and more energy than building the reactor itself. A re reactor contains 100 tonnes of uranium uh, put in, uh, it has control rods um, and it's all immersed in water. When you take the control rods out slowly, slowly, the neutrons start rushing around and breaking apart the uranium atoms, forming 200 new elements, none of which existed before man fissioned uranium, to make bombs. There, therefore, the uranium becomes one billion times more radioactive in the reactor than it was initially. And there's as much radiation, long-lived radiation, in the reactor as a thousand Hiroshima-sized bombs. Now, when Chernobyl melted down, and, and can we put the slide up, please? Um, a lot, one third of the inventory in Chernobyl got out and had only been running for a few months. Likewise, Fremont Island had only been running a few months. And there's a thing called the bathtub curve for reactors and for people. When a baby is born, in the first few months, it's liable to get meningitis, infectious disease and the like. Then during late childhood and middle life, we're pretty stable and pretty healthy. As we get older, our pipes get rusty. I've got a rusty aorta, our hearts don't work, and so we are more vulnerable to disease. Similarly with a reactor, in the first few years of life, it's vulnerable to a whole lot of abnormalities. It settles down, and as it gets older, it's, it's, it, it can have more abnormalities. 